This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I've got a special treat for all of you because I will be talking to a bucket list guest that I've been I've been contemplating getting on for a while, but I finally made the effort to contact her. I will be talking to Ellen Crawford. You all know her as the quirky nurse Lydia Wright on ER. She was on there the entire run. And um, she's also been in some cult classic movies such as Best Defense, Teacher, Stitches, Who's That Girl. She guest starred on so many classic sitcoms like Three's Company, New Heart, um, you know, um, she was, uh, she guest starred on Tales from the Crypt, she was on China Beach, she was on Mr. Belvedere, she's been in so many great things, and we're gonna have a great conversation today, you know, she was a Chicago actress back in the day, and she's married to Mike Genovese, uh, another, um, you know, um, Chicago-based actor, and it's gonna be a great conversation today, and even though it's a day late, I got to say, you know, rest in peace, the 9-11 victims. It's been 21 years since that horrible tragedy happened. Let's have a moment of silence for them. Rest in peace, 9-11 victims. So yeah, here is my interview with Ellen Crawford. Hey, Ellen. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm fine. How are you doing? I am just spectacular. I can't tell you what an honor this has been. You know, you've been making me laugh as long as I can remember, and I thank you so much for taking the time well, that's, today. That's good. It means I did something right in my life if I made you laugh. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? I did. It's a little terrifying how early I gravitated towards performing. Um, uh, I actually, when I was three, I was watching TV, mm-hmm. and I and I saw a ballerina, so I said, I want to do that, please. So I started dancing when I was three, uh, and then, yeah, I guess it wasn't until fourth grade I got interested in acting. But, you know, I was in the middle of the Midwest, um, so it was all about schools, maybe I'd play a child in university productions and stuff, but I wasn't like an L.A. Hollywood kid yeah. who was doing commercials and things like that. But my dad was in advertising, and, and he kept wanting me to do more stuff, but as I got to be a teenager, I was like, oh, no, oh, no, I'm it's so silly. I'm a serious actress. Now I'm just so happy to be doing commercials when I do them. Uh, but, <laughs> you know... Um, but at any rate, yeah, I, I very young age, for some reason, it was all I really wanted to do. So, you know, that's I singing, dancing, acting. That was that was my life, my interest. Mm-hmm. You were born and raised in Illinois. I I I, I was actually born uh, in Ohio, but I was raised. Um, most of the time in uh, most of my uh, childhood and young adulthood in normal Illinois. Normal Illinois. <laughs> what a normal name. Normal Illinois, yes. It's a university town. Illinois State University is there and also Illinois Wesleyan University town. Uh, so it's kind of a university town in the middle of corn and soybean fields, basically. Perfect place to grow up, actually. Yeah. <laughs> did, uh, did your parents support you going into acting? You know they did, and it was I was really lovely how much they supported me and um, and toted me around. They and my and my grandmother who lived with us. You know, when I look at the schedule, sometimes I think I ran across an old you know diary or something date book, and I, I saw before I drove how many places they had to drive me, wow. and they were great. They were very supportive and. You know, when I got my first job that was up in Chicago, I was supposed to go to college, but I wound up getting in a show at the Schubert instead, and they were like, well, you know, okay, it's a big chance. It's a union, my first union job, and 
and they were very supportive, even though it was a controversial show at the time. Uh, it was the Chicago Company, original Chicago Company of Hair. So oh. for them to go, oh, our little 18-year-old daughter, who I really was pretty much Bambi. I mean, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't drink beer in high school. I just, you know, I politically, I think I was aligned with that, but I, I was... Uh, socially very young, I think, but they were trusting and supportive and uh, the rest is history, but they were, no, they were always tremendously supportive. I was very lucky in that way. Oh, that's awesome. What, what, what college was the, uh, that you did hair in? Well, I was going to go, I would had a, the first theater scholarship to Illinois State University, uh, but then I wound up instead going to Carnegie Mellon University a couple of years later, because I thought it'd be nice to go get a Bachelor of Fine Arts and, and in a town where I didn't grow up in. And so I went to Pittsburgh to Carnegie Mellon. And then, of course, uh, Steppenwolf came out of Illinois State. So all of those people got tremendously famous. And uh, and uh, I, I, I know them a little because I was in Chicago, but I didn't wind up going to school with them as I would have actually but um mm. it all works out the way it's supposed to work out you know <laughs> yeah, absolutely after that did you go to new york uh i kind of was all it's it's funny because i uh, i did the chicago company and then i decided i don't know if this could be of any interest to anyone but i decided i wanted to be a backpacking teenager like everybody else and so after a year i said i'm still having a good time so i'm going to quit right now and and get my backpack on and go to Europe. Mm -hmm. I did for about four months. And then I came back and uh, actually went into the national tour of hair. Um, and I wound up, so I wound up working for about two years uh, and before I started at Carnegie Mellon, then every, <laughs> between my freshman and sophomore year, in those days, it's kind of changed there now, but in those days, there were severe cuts made every year to your class. So you didn't even know if you're going to go back the next year. Mm -hmm. And my, my summer job was taking my, my replacement had just left the national tour. And so I went back into my role of genie in uh, the national tour of hair. And uh, my summer job was touring like the West coast and Hawaii and Alaska <laughs> <with laughs> hair, which was not a bad summer job, making money for my next year of college. And uh, so basically every summer I would work as a professional actor to earn money to go back and learn to be a better professional actor. So it was an odd situation, but it, it worked out for me. And then when I graduated, my first job out of college was um, what's now called the Repertory Theater of St. Louis. At that time it was called the Loretto Hilton. Mm -hmm. And... Um, to be in the company there and also teach in the conservatory they had there at Webster College and now Webster University. So I did that for a couple of years. I did a lot of regional theater. So my work, because I was kind of immediately hired, I was working a lot of regional theater from town to town, city to city. And uh, I did wind up in New York for a while, and I did... Uh, I did very long out-of-town tryouts, very successful out-of-town tryouts of a show that ran two weeks on Broadway. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was the Black Patent. I actually went to Chicago mm -hmm. for a while um, and was living there and working out of there. And then he yeah, did Patent Leather Shoes in New York. And and uh, that in that I was playing this, 104 year old nun at the ripe old age of 20 something and uh, <laughs> and uh, so I did that and had fun and yeah so I did some time in New York but a lot of time in Chicago and regional theater and then um, wound up on the west coast which had a lot to do with uh, with Mr. Mike Genovese actually my husband oh yes he was the basketball yeah. coach on Family Matters he was, and he was my husband on ER. Well, my boyfriend, and then my fiance, and later on we got married on ER. He was Sergeant Al Grabarski. Yeah. <laughs> and um, 
Yeah, he, uh, yeah, that's right. Family Matters. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've seen that episode uh, many times since I was a kid. I have all the lines memorized. <laughs> He's so funny in that episode. <laughs> <laughs> it, it depends on, on your, it's funny how people know you, because I remember for a while people knew me because I did a little recurring on 7th Heaven, and that mm -hmm. age group knew that because they watched 7th Heaven all the time. And, and then we would always laugh, Michael and I, going to airports because it was, uh, you know, certain members of the airport, uh, like the baggage handlers and everybody knew him from uh, Blood In, Blood Out or Harlem Nights or, or you know, uh, Cut of Silence. And, the, you know, the people at the desk and the flight attendants would know me more from ER. <laughs> yeah. It's just kind of dep <laughs> depends on what you're into, what, uh, what you remember. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It I've, I've talked to uh, many Chicago actors, and you know they tell me just what a magical time it was to be doing Chicago theater in the 70s, because you had guys like yeah. Joe Mantegna and Meshack Taylor and Dennis Franz coming up in the scene, and then you had the Steppenwolf people, you know, it was just, you know, yeah, it was a yeah. time before the internet, everybody knew each other. Well, Joey uh, Mantegna and his wife Arlene were both in the original Chicago Company of Hair with me, so that's how I knew them. Oh, that's right. Originally, and then uh, and and Meshach, uh, I was on the National Tour of Hair with, so I knew him that way. Uh, fantastic actors and and really really wonderful people. Stan Shaw was in that company too, and uh, Elena Reed, who you may remember from Sesame Street. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, so there were some really amazing people in that company that, and yeah, the Steppenwolf people, of course, were, are all astounding actors. And, uh, yeah. And um, so, yeah, it was a magical time in, in the Midwest in general. I mean, I, I had some great times in regional theater, other cities. Uh, I have friends from that time that will always be my friends, and I don't know it. It was, as you say, just kind of a magical time for theater there. Mm -hmm. I, I've and I guess we were, we were in our 20s, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've I've talked to you know Vinny and Cynthia Augustafero and Bob Swan. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Bob Swan and Sherry Narens um, and um, yeah, it was just a magical time for Chicago actors. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I did shows with, with Bob uh, and uh, we did musicals on stage actually, and and uh, um, Michael and worked with Vinny. I'm trying to think of Vinny and I must have done something together. Anyway, yeah, and I worked together out here actually once, but um, it's, it's funny. Everybody's sort of tight. There's something about that group, that time mm -hmm. that is very special. Did, did you ever do any improv training? Well, at Carnegie Mellon we had improv training, uh, but I never did the Second City uh, yeah. stuff there. Um, so mine was more when I was in school at Carnegie Mellon, and I uh, I think I was always a little terrified of trying to be funny on stage, but <laughs> <laughs> I did my best. Um, uh, so not not as some people did with Second City or or companies out here, you know. Um, mm hmm Because you're so good at comedy, you know. You know you know well, how to. You. Yeah, because you know how to work those unique, uh, those unique expressive eyes that you have, you know, for for comedic effect, you know. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. I enjoy it, you know. And I and I, uh, you know, theater mm -hmm. is a great teacher. I think it's the best teacher. I love still doing theater. Of course, it's my first love, and uh, then you just have to adjust it for television and film. Yeah, you, you got a uh, Joseph Jefferson nomination for Coming of Age, a play you did at the North Light Theater. Um, what was, I did. What, what was that experience like? That was, what, well, was my first year coming back to Chicago to work. Mm -hmm. And um, and I uh, I was, it, it was a very good play by Frank Cucci. And um, I was, yeah, like I said, I was pretty new in town, so it was kind of a big deal that I got nominated for the, the chef because I was new in town and 
one of Michael's old friends, B.J. Jones, that I was just getting to know, who now runs Northlight. But he played opposite me in that particular show. Mm -hmm. And um, it was funny uh, because I was playing... Uh, I was playing older than I was, which I pretty much done all of my life. Um, and I think she was supposed to be 30, in her 30s or something. I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. And uh, BJ was an old high school boyfriend. My, I was a young widow. And, um, and it was funny because, uh, I, because I'm very blonde, um, uh, um, Dennis Zacek, who was directing that particular show, uh, thought, you know, we, we talked about it, well, maybe I'll get an Auburn wig, and I'll wear it in rehearsal so people don't get, you know, mm -hmm. are used to seeing me more as a brunette. And, and Frank Cucci came to watch the last couple of weeks rehearsal. <laughs> yeah. He said, well, you know, you look good like this, but you know, he saw me without my wig, he said, you know, you look more like my sister that I based this on, because she was blonde. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by then we had, you know, that I hadn't looked like this, and it was fine. But uh, but I really enjoyed, it was a good play. I enjoyed it very much. I enjoyed. It's always great when the playwright can come in and, and work with you. Um, so yeah, that was that was an exciting time. That's awesome. What year did you move to LA? I moved to LA in 1983. Got married in 1982. So we're about to to celebrate our 40th anniversary this year. Wonderful. I uh, got married in 1982 and uh, moved out here in 83. Oh, congrats. Uh, that 1983 is the year I was born. <laughs> <laughs> We've been married longer than you were born. Yeah, I think I was conceived around the time you were married. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. It was a happy time for all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Obviously, they were having fun at your house, too, so there you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you were on a, um, a uh, it was it was like a romantic anthology series. It was called Romance Theater. Oh, Romance Theater. Yeah, that, um, I'm trying to remember which, what are the titles on it? <laughs> Let's see. I, I, I've, I've talked to like three other people, three or four other people who were on here. They don't remember anything from it either. <laughs> uh, Gam... Yeah. Gamble on Love, part one through five, you were in. Okay. Mm -hmm. That actually may be the one. There was, for a while, they said somebody was, uh, that I was listed as something else. And I had to tell IMDb I was never listed as that. And I think Gamble, that, yes, they just maybe added it to people's resumes because I yeah. have no memory of that at all. That's weird. No memory of that at all. And I do remember at one time, and it can be tricky changing your IMDb. Yeah. Uh, I was like, I, I, I've never been anyone but Ellen Crawford, and I don't remember doing this project, and I hope it didn't like involve odd things like, you know, yeah. <laughs> German Shepherds and hotel rooms or anything, but, um, <laughs> I, but I don't have any memory of that. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah. You did, <laughs> you did a funny episode of New Heart. That was my first job out in L.A., actually. Uh-huh. No, it was my second job. My first job that I got, I got when I came out to visit, uh, mm -hmm. just um, to meet people, and within 24 hours, that was nice, because within 24 hours I had a job, which was nice. And it was uh, kind of a... Um, it was a medical school comedy. Yep. Uh, yeah, called Stitches. I love that movie. And, and, and <laughs> yeah, and I was uh, Eddie Albert's secretary. Yep. I was hot for some student. And, yeah. <laughs> and it was another one of my bun rolls. I call my bun rolls. I never met Eddie Albert because we were on the phone, so they shot us separately. But, right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that was my... It, it was notable in the... I, came out to L.A. and immediately got cast in that my first 24, 48 hours. And then I went, that, that, so that was cool. And then New Heart mm -hmm. was then when I moved out here, my first job. And uh, he had been like an idol of mine. He was one of my father's favorites. So we had all of his albums growing up. So that was really kind of a thrill. And I wish that my father were still alive and he could know I was on New Heart. <laughs> but... 
<laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, you and Ke- uh, Kenneth Kimmins play a married couple, uh, and you're both. You no, know, I and I was mm-hmm. just on Facebook with Ken Kimmins the other day with his birthday. I think just a few days ago, and I was like, "Happy birthday!" And I was like, "Wow, <laughs> you know, long time ago." But <laughs> yeah, you both you both uh, are trying to pull a runner to get to to check out of the hotel without paying, and That's, oh, you get caught. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a funny episode, and then. Uh, My apologies to anybody. On, if you, if you have information about Gamble on Love and that romance series, and, and you want to remind me what it is, I, I really apologize to anyone who once gave me a job and I don't remember it. I really. Do. I have no idea what's up with that. You know, if they're like just putting random names on that and it didn't exist, I don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah. Then uh, you were on a funny episode of Three's Company uh, when Jack is in drag as a grandma. <laughs> yes, Grandma Tripper, and that, and my mother used to always laugh and say, "Oh yes, she, she's a, just a little off color, but she, she was a very proper lady. But she would occasionally come up with a quip. She'd say, oh, yes, she's stepped on Jack's nuts because I would like tip his ingredients over and tromp on them and go, oh, I'm so sorry, because we were in a baking competition.' <laughs> yeah. And uh, that, yeah, that was, it was just such a treat to watch John Ritter work. What a master of oh. comedy, and such a nice, sweet, lovely guy. Very generous guy. And uh, We lost him way yeah. too soon. That was just heartbreaking. Way, way, way too soon. Yeah, that was awful. Uh, yeah, he throws flour in your face during the the cooking contest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Parley Bear was in that. Parley Bear was uh, the kind of announcer judge or something. And Parley Bear, he was like the mayor in Mayberry for a while, and he was like oh, yeah. the Keeper Elf, and he was like on the Lucy show. I I was new to town, and I just would sit and have Parley just tell me stories because he was. That's what you want to do. You don't want, you want to learn from the people who've been out there the longest. And he was a great storyteller and just a wonderful guy. And a really, really fun member of Polly Bear from that. Mm-hmm. You did an, um, an episode of After Mash. How was that? Oh, yeah, that was... That's your, you've really gone through it. Well, um, yep. challenging my memory, but that's easy to remember because Jamie Farr uh, was a sweetheart and... Uh, it was fun to do, and what I loved about Jamie Farr is he was so professional. First of all, generous, friendly, all that. But he was like, you want to rehearse? So he was really, really loved getting together and preparing before we actually shot the thing, which is kind of, you know, for a theater actor, it's kind of your dream because you like doing that stuff. Uh, so that was a pleasure because of that. Yeah, my friend uh, Lois Foraker was on there. Oh, yeah, I know Lois. Yeah, she. I, I spent like a month going back and forth with her about coming on the podcast because uh, she knew she was going to be controversial about, you know, the truth of Hollywood and, and fat shaming and all of that stuff. And mm-hmm. once we did it, she was extremely comfortable and we became good friends. Oh, God, our, our, our unrecorded conversations are hilarious because we yes. both... We both have a body sense of humor, you know, so we do a lot of swearing and stuff, and yeah. <laughs> it is absolutely wonderful. <laughs> oh, she's the best. Yeah. She, she's the best, yeah. How, how do you get cast in Best Defense? Um, I auditioned, and mm-hmm. again, I was pretty early on in my career out here, um, being in L.A., and, uh, yeah, we, I'm trying to remember what the audition was, you know, because mostly it was, it was like kind of an improv group that surrounded Dudley Moore. They just hired a bunch of actors that I think they thought were good, and we, we kind of made a little community around him as his fellow engineers. Right. So, uh, so that was, that was, it was very funny, though. It didn't do so well at the box office best defense uh, no nor did, nor did mm. Howard the Duck that I did to the same producers though I was cut out of Howard the Duck really because they had a problem mm. no but they it, it wasn't their fault they I, I 
what happened is that I shot, I went up to San Francisco to shoot the scene right. with the duck, the animatronic duck. Yeah. And I guess they had some problems with the duck when they looked at the film that they did, they wanted to fix. And when they got ready to reshoot, I wasn't available and they had a really tight schedule. So I wound up not being in Howard the Duck. But it did seem funny because for a while, it was like every film I was in, they would, they, they would say, of the eight pictures, the worst film of the year was <laughs> the <laughs> one I was in, right? Uh, but, but I had a great time and I got to tell you, I would not trade having worked with Dudley Moore for anything. He was, the, again, someone who lost way too soon. Just yeah. A master, of again, of comedy and gorgeously generous guy and just lovely guy. So oh, can, I've had a lot of good luck working with people like that in my life. Yeah, can, can you guess why my middle name is Arthur? It's because my mom had. Uh, a, it's because my mom had a crush on him. <laughs> oh wow! Wow, that's great. Well, I understand it. Susan Anton understood it too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, you know, I don't think Best Defense and Howard the Duck are as bad as people say they are. I think. I don't think so either. I think that I think that they're great. You know, um, but w- what did you do with Howard the Duck? Well, I was supposed to be that there was a teacher that had a scene with the duck and all that when mm-hmm. we flew up to San Francisco, but I wound up not doing it. I forget who did it. And then I guess, I think I did some looping for it because, um... Oh, I know who you're talking about. Um, her name's Maureen. I can't remember her last name. She was a San Francisco actress, and I know somebody who knows her from San Francisco theater because I'm a San Francisco guy. So, oh, okay. Yeah, I know who you're talking about, though. Oh, yeah, that would have been funny to see you play the teacher. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was supposed to be, but oh well, was not. It was not meant to be. Yeah. <laughs> I guess yeah. paid for the day. That's always good, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember when you played the social worker in Teachers. Oh, yeah. That's another one. We shot in Ohio, actually. Really? And I brought my mom over. Yeah, I said, it's got a really nice hotel room. Come on over and we'll have dinner. <laughs> wow. And she was living in Ohio at the time. And, uh, and again, a really, really great cast. And, uh, and yeah, that was... One of those. It's one of those where you, where you fly into location and you're. If you don't sleep well the night before, you're nervous about how it's going to go. But it went fine. fine. You know, uh, it was. Uh, I liked that film. That was a good film. Yeah, me and my dad used to watch it when my mom wasn't home. <laughs> ah. It's a. It's a. It's a great movie. Did you? Did, did yeah. you? I, for, I forget. You worked with Nick Nolte. I didn't. I worked with uh, Richard. Um, Richard Mulligan. Richard Mulligan. M- Richard Mulligan, another just beautiful actor that that we lost way too early. Also, um, I think I, I hope that's not me. It's, <laughs> uh, it's he was uh, yeah great guy to work with. Also, I had a really good time on that. Yeah, he's the schizophrenic <laughs> who pretends. Yes, exactly. pre- who, 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 oh, you know everything inside out. I'm so impressed. Oh, it's gonna get it's gonna it's gonna get you know even better from here. <laughs> uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> I yeah, I mean I love movies, you know, and television and stuff. Um, do you remember guest starring on a short-lived series called Other World? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and Peter Medak directed that. Who directed a famous film? Uh, Zorro the Gay Blade. What's that? He he directed Zorro the Gay Blade. No, but he directed some major like. Oh um. Really. The Changeling. No, let me think. Mm. I'm think what else he directed because there was something I remember he was super famous director. But anyway, yeah, that was an odd little sci-fi series that I did. Yeah. I mean, wow, I had forgotten about that. Yeah, it was it was weird back in those days. You know, they would put out these sci-fi shows, and they wouldn't do well like the movies were doing in sci-fi. It was it's was, it was really yeah. strange. Yeah, because V was on and um, uh, Misfits of Science and all these sci-fi shows, but for some reason they just didn't last long. Well, we had uh, when when if we get to talking about ER, I'll tell you about the connection with V. 
I'm pretty sure it was V. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. V. Yeah. We'll. Oh, we'll get to ER. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so, so, tell me again. Like, how did you get cast in Stitches? Um, Stitches. I went in for an interview. It was, it, I had was inter- I was. I went in to uh, meet with casting directors, and I had uh, my agent from Chicago had just. Um, partnered with an agency in L.A., so I think they just submitted me, and I went in and met them, and they cast me, like, that day. Um, it was kind of like that. I just went in and, and met the director, uh, and then the rest, and then I just did it, you know? I mean, it was an audition. Mm-hmm. They liked me. They cast me. Um... And, uh, yeah, I used to watch it on USA Up all night when I was like nine or ten, and it was all chopped up, you know. But like, I think if this movie had been made about ten years later, it probably would have been Mindy Sterling in your role because you remind me of her so much in this uh, character. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow, well, yeah, it it was. Uh, I think it was Mindy Sterling that that uh, actually. Yeah, part. Ron Holcomb, actually, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this because he actually did take his name off the film, and it was yes. one of those Alan Smithy pictures, right? Right. Uh, where nobody, but that's the first time I worked with Rod Holcomb, who directed the pilot of ER. It turned out. So a few years later, I worked with Rod again, <laughs> uh, but he, he cast me in uh, Stitches, actually. Yeah, pretty immediately. Yeah, I like and what. He liked me, I guess. So that was nice. I like when Parker Stevenson asks you what time you get off work and you aggressively tap the desk with a, a piece of paper. <laughs> it's so brilliant. <laughs> oh, man. I just, I gotta have it to you. you. You know more about me than I know about me, I think. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, I, uh, di- I dig thank deep. Thank you. It's quite, no. How was um, doing the TV remake of Picnic? Because, you know, it was, we did it at the Denver Center and the Amundsen. We, it was created for the Amundsen. And then uh, we, before we went, um, were performing the Amundsen, we mm-hmm. did a run at the Denver Center. And what a cast. I mean, pretty much an all-star cast. Yeah. And, and that was all so funny because... Um, I think they pretty much had a cast. And when people say, oh, open equity class, nobody ever, ever, ever um, gets anything from them. Marshall Mason was directing, he was quite a famous Broadway director. And uh, people are saying, yeah, you might see him, you know, get to see him on the third callback for auditioning for a show. And I went in for an open call at the Amundsen, you know, because they have to see the puny world. They have to see people and the, the, the... uh, production stage manager was conducting them. Yeah. And I auditioned, and he said, oh, Marshall needs to meet you. And um, so I came in the next day and, and met with him and auditioned, and I think they had the whole thing cast, but he decided, Marshall decided to add another school teacher because yeah. <laughs> he liked me enough to want to put me on stage and kind of divvy up the lines amongst us so that he could, uh, so he actually weirdly uh, created the role of Olive for me mm-hmm. uh, so I could be in the play. And uh, and it was just, I mean, what a cast. And Jennifer Jason Lee's first play, I think. Yeah. And, uh, Gregory Harris, playing up with Gregory Harris. And oh. Michael Learned and Rue McClanahan and Kachat Farrell. And then Beth Grant was one of the teachers with me. Uh, and and uh, Brady Rubin, we were the three teachers, and we just, we had a ball, you know. Dana Hill, I think, played that. Yeah, she was great. I'm sad that she passed. Oh, yeah, what a wonderful little actress she was. And, uh, yeah, we had, uh, we had we had a ton of fun on tour at, in L.A., mm. and then just to get do a Showtime special of it was just the icing on the cake, you know. yeah. Great fun. Great fun. I, back in the 2000s, I used to email celebrities. This is long before podcasts, and I would ask them questions. I, I got to email Gregory Harrison, and he replied me back. Just this wonderful, 
um, message uh, with answering my questions. He's he's a great guy. I can just tell that oh, he's got nice. that. Yeah, I haven't seen him in years, but he was a lovely guy to work with then, for sure. Yeah, he was a very nice guy. He even told me he uh, turned down Airplane because he was doing Trapper John M.D. Oh, yeah, that happened. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> I remember when you were in Who's That Girl as the Tiffany saleswoman. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I mean, she, there was nothing bigger by that point. I mean, she probably had, like, a huge entourage on set. Because I have talked to a few people who were who worked on the movie, including Bob Swan, and told me, yeah, I mean, she was so huge. I mean, there was security around her and everything. Yeah, was, she'd already done um, Definitely Seeking Susan. Yes. But um, she, uh, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, in fact, on that movie, Like a Virgin hit number one, I believe it was the last yeah. week of filming, and they went from having her with no entourage to having an entourage because everyone like wanted to talk to her and get her autograph and stuff. <laughs> right. And, of course, we were shooting in uh, Beverly Hills, and, of course, they put very expensive jewelry on you, all of which they have to sign you in and out for, you know. They put it on you, and they take it off, you believe me. When you yeah. <laughs> I know I've seen I've seen Pretty Woman. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. How was working with uh, David Hemmings on that episode of Werewolf? Oh wow, um, that was uh, that was fun to shoot. First of all, John, who was the young lead on that, um, was a friend of mine from Chicago, so that was fun. And I I worked. Uh, yeah, that that uh -huh. was just such a weird, weird kind of role because I turned into a werewolf at one point, and I, I think that that was the same year that I did played a trans channeler in uh, Night Court, uh, werewolf in werewolf, and yeah, I think I was a ghost in something else. It was my supernatural year, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was uh, that was yeah. This is that, what that was a funny show to do because I got to transform from this kind of drunken landlady into this vicious werewolf so I, I, this hey, is, what's, what's not to like about getting yeah. <laughs> this is one of the few things you did I didn't see like did they have to put makeup on you and everything oh yeah I would hope mm -hmm. that I'd have to have makeup to be an old drunk landlady and to be a werewolf yeah I don't really look like that but yeah, um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah there was some really pretty extreme makeup Oh, because I didn't know if it happened off screen or not. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, they, uh, gosh, I'm trying to remember. But yeah, I think they had to put teeth and, and all that stuff in later. After you met me as the rundown drunk that I was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I revisited this the other night. I remember when you were the nun on Mr. Belvedere. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, Tracy Wells and that guy who wants to be a priest, they go on that mock honeymoon to that convent-like oh hotel. Oh, I can't believe it. Yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, I had just come from doing uh, – I was comfortable in a habit because I – well, I had done several nuns. Uh, I did the nun on Broadway in Pat Shoes, and I did uh, some other plays where I played a nun. But, uh, yeah, it was uh, – I was so tickled because – I looked inside the habit, and it was uh, Jane, um, oh, gosh, um, Jane. let's see, uh, Jane Powell's habit. Okay. Her name was like in, like her name tag was in it, and I was so thrilled that I was actually wearing the same nun's habit as Jane Powell, that was really exciting. 
<laughs> and, wow. and so, yeah. Um, but that was fun. You know, I had, yeah, my, my early years in L.A., I did a lot of yeah. common. I really, really enjoyed it. The door, yeah, the door flings open. It's you and three other nuns with that wedding basket. And, like, you put the basket down, and then you give them a wink, like, it's on the house. <laughs> yeah. I remember that That actually was, I think, the end of my demo reel at one point, was I would, like, be winking and saying it's on the house, and then to blast. But, uh, and then I recently played a nun again, so I, and I was thinking about that. It's like, oh, I think the last time I played a nun on camera was maybe Mr. Belvedere. Yeah. Uh, but I, was, I had a recurring on Days of Our Lives as another spirit. I, I, I have a theory. Um, I, I have a theory, and I've seen this. I have never met an actress who played a nun and was innocent in real life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably true. Probably true. Now, I can't speak for the real nuns, but I, I think that's probably true of those of us who play them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then you worked with uh, Danny DeVito on The War of the Roses? Oh, you know, that. You bring up all these memories out of the bottom for a long time. Uh, I think it was, I think it was maybe the second film he directed, because the first was Throw Mama from the Train, I think. Yes, it was. Uh, but, um... Third overall, because he directed a TV movie called The Ratings Game first, and then Throw okay. Mama from the Train, and then War of the Roses. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny, because uh, I went in to meet with him, and I just was a big fan of his anyway. Oh, yeah. And I went in, and he was... Oh, sweet. I mean, it was almost like, um, it was almost apologetic for making the audition. There wasn't really much of a script for the role. It was, a, you know, it was uh, Michael Douglas's nurse, you know, when he thinks he's having a heart attack or something. And my, my big nurse moment, my, when I learned how to take a blood pressure mm -hmm. uh, on Michael Douglas, actually. Uh, not a bad job. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, he was, he was just, Oh, sweet. It was like, would you mind doing, you know, like I said, almost apologetic about making me audition for something that I, and I really was so thrilled to be there. I just remember him being such a sweetheart. That that's my memory of Danny DeVito, that he was, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. You, you and um, Richard Lineback played a couple on China Beach, and... Oh, yeah. This was a funny episode. My red, white, and blue polyester moment. <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah, you two want Marg Helgenberg's baby, and she's multitasking, talking to you. Meanwhile, going to the next room to make a horror deal with Vic Polizos. <laughs> right, right, right. That was a because and Mimi Leader directed that. Yeah. Who later I worked with a lot on ER, and mm -hmm. John Wells was producing China Beach actually at that time. He produced ER, and John Wells was also a Carnegie Mellon person, and and I remember Mimi was funny because, you know, John was from Carnegie Mellon and she said, gosh, we've got so many Carnegie Mellon people. If I had known you were from Carnegie Mellon, maybe she, she was joking about hiring yet another Carnegie Mellon person, but she didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that was, as I say, I, I love that little red, white, and blue polyester uh, outfit I wore. and uh, it, But it was this kind of, weird combination of like a Preston Sturges comedy and this kind of uh, very bizarre kind of surrealistic view of of Vietnam. You know, I mean, it was odd. Mm -hmm. As, uh, you know, later on you had that very weird birth scene in the alley and, you know, just odd things going on. And, mm -hmm. and crisscrossed with all these, you know, doors flying open, mistaken identities, and, you know, it was maybe the, the most interesting episode, I think, of that series, because it was just such an odd combination of things. So that was, uh, yeah, that was, just in memory, that I think was a really unique uh, episode, and so I was happy to be part of it, and of course had a fun time. And I have My to first say, time working with Mimi. yeah, and I have to say, you look so beautiful in this episode. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, when you aren't playing, you know, these hideous nightmare of of women, <sighs> you are a beautiful woman. Uh, you know, there's Aww. 
there's character actresses right. out there that can do that, like Lin Shay and uh, God, so many. But like, yeah, you're you're one of them. I mean, you are gorgeous. Oh, you made my day! What a beautiful thing to say. Thank you. Absolutely. My goodness. My goodness. Absolutely. I'm I mean, blushing. I mean it. <laughs> Tell me about uh, Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> and like I say, you bring up all these fun memories. Um, <laughs> Tales from the Crypt, that's another one where I was playing a little older. I was playing, John Vernon has passed away. He's very wealthy, and I'm very wealthy yeah. widow of John Vernon. And, um, and, uh, 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 and the, the, the stars of that were, first of all, worked with a uh, director who was just out of, oh, just, oh, see, this is where you, you probably have more stuff than I do at the moment. I'm, I'm, names are it's, failing me. Uh, oh, yes. Um, Ka- well, there's Kathy, Mori- uh, Kathy Moriarty, uh, Ben yeah, Cross. Kathy, and, and, yeah, and, and, of course, she was completely delightful, and so was he. You know, working with big movie stars, really, but they yeah. were... Um, Gar- uh, the director had directed... Um, Gary Fledger. Yeah, Gary Fledger, because he went on to be a big director and mostly in Tales from the Crypt they had really established uh, really established directors that were movie directors primarily oh yeah and so he it was like kind of a big deal that he was just out of um, out of school and they hired him to do this episode and uh, and it, it was a um, Kathy and Ben were great and uh uh uh, uh well, Harry, Harry Anderson wrote the episode. Who did? Harry Anderson from Night Court. Oh, really? I, I don't think I even knew that. Yeah. I didn't remember that. <laughs> wow. And who played uh, the, uh, the, the kind of gypsy in that? She's a magnificent actress. But oh, um, best, um, Lupe, Lupe Ontiveros. Hmm. Lupe Ontiveros, wonderful actress. Yeah. I mean, the cast was flawless, and and I I I loved doing it. I mean, it was just it was a, it was, I mean, uh, Tales from the Crypt was a fun series anyway, and I I got to be in my best, you know, use my best stage standard for this very wealthy woman, mm. uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they dressed me all in this very lovely black ensemble. Um, it was fun to do. Yeah, it was. That was, that was how how do you get cast Kathy, on? We, Go ahead. we didn't touch with Kathy for a little bit after that, but then we lost touch. But yeah. Oh yeah, didn't she have like a pizza place or something? She did Mulberry Street. Yeah, we went to the opening of it. Yeah. <laughs> and I just saw some place I was in some bar, and they had Mulberry Street. And I was did they still have that? Because I kind of lost touch, but I have no idea. But I, I know that she had it because uh, when she was doing that sitcom, "Bless This House" with Andrew Dice Clay, he used to uh, go to their go to that uh, restaurant all the time. It was good pizza, good yeah. pizza. But I think it's still around because I, I think I saw a sign for it the other day. I, was, I didn't know. Yeah, how how do you get cast on ER? <laughs> well, um, I went in. I mean, John Levy had brought me in for other things, and I knew. John Wells, uh, not only did I know John Wells from working for him, but I also knew him because uh, we had been, uh, I, when he was president of the alumni, drama alumni from Carnegie Mellon, and I was the treasurer, uh, I mean the secretary. Uh, so we knew each other a little bit, but I went in and actually, uh, I don't know if you remember the pilot, you probably do, you probably know everything much more, better than I do. But, I vaguely um, remember it, yeah. There was a couple um, that uh, he was a policeman and uh, he had been shot and it was an accident between his wife that turned out and shot him by mistake. Mm-hmm. And they were going to be kind of frequent flyer patients. And at the time, John, the two Johns knew me and knew my husband, Mike Genovese, mm-hmm. and thought it would be fun to have us as that couple, you know. Um, and so uh, they brought me, they were going to bring me us in for that. And Michael was actually, had been um, within going to Maui. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry. Uh, Michael had, 
it was in Maui shooting a pilot for um because uh for uh, 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 oh Magnum PI uh oh Tom Selleck no no uh the producer uh Glenn Larson uh, Belsario oh okay uh, um had offered him just offered him a role in a pilot uh which Crowfoot, which is the one Bill Sario pilot didn't take off, unfortunately, because Michael was already figuring out who could visit him in Maui all the time. Um, but he was shooting that pilot at the same time ER was shooting. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, so I said, well, you know, Michael's not available, and uh, but can I come in anyway? And I read the script on it. I kind of like this nurse called Lydia. Could I audition for that? And they went, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, I think I went in and asked on the spot. And they said, yeah, read it. Uh, and so I read that role. And I remember the casting assistant coming out in the parking lot and saying, I think you're going to hear something very soon. So I knew, I knew it looked pretty good. And so that's how I got cast as Lydia. And... Mm -hmm. um, that time they had added names because in the original film script, which is what it was originally, mm -hmm. those nurses actually didn't have them. I think nurse one, nurse two, nurse three, you know, they weren't specific names at that time. So uh, I was named Lydia Woodward because she was a friend of John's, I think, John Wells. And then she became a writer on the series. So they had to change me to Lydia Wright because they couldn't actually have. Lydia Woodward's name on it. So in the pilot, I'm Lydia Woodward, and after that, I'm Lydia Wright. But uh, but that's how it happened. And so I was, while we were shooting in the basement of a hospital in Boyle Heights, Michael was shooting <laughs> in beautiful Maui, and we shot that ER pilot for two months because it was a two-hour pilot. And uh, mm -hmm. and I, my character actually, you saw at the end of one shift and then the beginning of the next shift. So I had two weeks off, so I went to Maui to visit <laughs> my husband in this beautiful hotel and mm -hmm. in Hawaii, and I came back and everybody had been in the basement in Boyle, <laughs> right in this hospital. They all looked like the mole people to me. <laughs> uh, remember, I brought back uh, chocolate-covered uh, macadamia nuts for everybody, and Sherry Stringfield was like, yeah, you're in Maui and we're in the <laughs> but it was, uh, yeah, yeah. What? So that's how I got in ER and how Michael wound up not being in ER until later mm -hmm. when they decided that uh, it would be fun to have uh, one of the nurses have uh, a policeman, a cop boyfriend, because that happens from time to time between that. Uh, and so that's how they actually created the role for Michael later. Of Sergeant Al Grabarsky. Wow. Which was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you must have been shocked when it was a hit right out of the gate. I mean, had you done pilots before that didn't go and you just thought this was going to be another one of those? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'd certainly seen pilots not go. And this one, I was, when I read the script, I went, oh, this is very unusual. And I think we knew when we were shooting it that it was good. Mm hmm. But I always say, and, and Ron Holcomb was a fantastic director, um, and, uh, but I think at the same time, there was another medical show that had more famous people in it, Mandy Patinkin and Chicago Hope. Yeah. And we were on the same night, and, um, and I remember one of the crew people going, well, that's the show to be on, that's the one with the stars, and I thought, oh. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> and it went, did very well, and I really hoped that they would both go, because they both had tremendous guest star casts, which was great for the acting community, you know. And I thought, I wish we weren't up against each other, and eventually they did they did move so they weren't up against each other, which was good, So, because we were clearly the big hit, but they, need, they were doing well, and it needed to be on the air. It was a different kind, a little more of an old, more old-fashioned kind of show, but because we were all those quick cuts, it was really uh, pretty revolutionary at that time. Mm -hmm. um, 
But it was a really good show, so I was glad that we both we both were doing well. But I, I remember saying to people, I, I knew it was going to be good. I didn't know it was going to be that good. I mean, when I watched it, I was kind of blown away at how good it was. Because you're putting together all those little bitty pieces. And I mean, even down to, there was an actor, oh shoot, I, I should look up his name and did once for another interview about ER, but mm -hmm. there was an actor in the pilot whose father died and he, he kind of goes after Mark Green, mm -hmm. actor played by Tony uh, Edwards and... Yeah. And he, he's just, he's furious because his father died, and then he just collapses in his arms weeping. This is like maybe a three-minute scene. Yeah. And this guy is just, was just stupendous. I mean, it was. And so you have all of those all together, all of these moments strung together. The impact when I saw it was, although I knew it was going to be good, I, I had no idea it was going to be that good. But you know it was almost not picked up. There were some executives who didn't want to pick it up, those executives did not remain, I yeah. don't think, Warner Brothers and, or uh, the network, wherever they were, because it became such an enormous hit. But there were people who were saying, nah, don't, don't pick it up. Um, yeah. And then, you know, it, it was, uh, when we hit a 40 share, which in those days really, uh, I don't know if you could even hit a 40 share these days, because there are so many shows, but... 40% of the public is watching your show out of all the choices. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, that was really significant. And, uh, yeah, there was, yeah, so, there was a series in the 80s called ER that didn't last with Elliot Gould and Jason Alexander, and I, I'm sure uh, w once somebody in the industry realized that that series had existed, they were probably worried about this one just because of the title, you know? Well, and that was a sitcom, because my friend Shuko Kune was in that, and it came from a play that they did in Chicago. It was based on a play they did in Chicago called ER. And mm -hmm. I think George was actually on that one, too, as a guest star or something at some point. I think he did that sitcom yeah. as a guest star. Uh, but it was obviously very different. It wasn't a drama. It was a little half-hour sitcom. But. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, I remember, God, this show was just such a hit out of the gate. Saturday Night Live made fun of it. They called it WR, Waiting Room. It was so funny. They they had Chris Elliott play Anthony Edwards on it, and he looked just like him with his receding hairline. You know? <laughs> I had a, a thing framed that I gave my husband for one Valentine's Day. He yeah. was uh, on the older series, The Flash, not the more recent one, but the oh, yeah. series, The Flash. Yeah, he was kind of the the the, the guy in you know the commander, uh, the boss, and uh, they came out with a, a comic book version with the characters from the series. Mm -hmm. So you saw these, you know, him on. I, I cut out a page of it and I framed it with. I was so proud when my I got a call from my sister in law, and she said. Uh, at that time, my nephew was a little boy, and she said, um, I think that you might be in Mad Magazine. <laughs> he had come home and said, hey, I think Aunt Ellen's in Mad Magazine. <laughs> and it was, the, it was, it said sick, or, you know, sick ER. And uh, it was, of course, their take on our show, and it was this, you know, I looked so tired and so drawn and I had these you know, kind of bags under my eyes and this cup of coffee and I was I looked hideous. And I and, and I said I said to my, my sister in law, I said, uh, I said, Oh, I said, Am I hideous? Because I figured I was am I hideous? She said, You couldn't land a plane on that note. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna go out and buy it immediately. I was so proud to be in that magazine and so I, I took a page of that and a page from the um, the Flash comic book, and I framed them and gave them to my husband for Valentine's Day. I just thought that was really, really fun. So, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Was Michael was Michael Creighton on set a lot? Uh, some in the beginning, um, you know, for the pilot, because he wrote the pilot, as, as I said, as a film, film yeah. really. Uh, such an incredibly tall man, and I think one of those examples of, I guess, burning out your light mm -hmm. so quickly with all of the, it's unbelievable.
unbelievable how much he created in his short time on Earth. Uh, Westworld, Jurassic uh, Park, I mean, he was the master of the dangers of technology. And, and all the novels. He wrote, I think he wrote uh, ER while he was, like, green, getting no sleep, being, you know, at, at uh, Mass General, I think, as I recall. Yeah. Um, as an intern, it was how he did everything he did. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it probably took its toll, but it's just astonishing that way uh astonishingly prolific how did you feel uh, how did you feel when george clooney left oh you know i sad of course because he there's nobody like george i mean george is what you think george may be that's who he is i mean he's, yeah. he is loyal to his friends he's funny 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 mm -hmm. um uh a jokester but he is very down to earth. Mm -hmm. um, so I was sad, but I got it. I mean, I certainly understood when he left. I yeah. understood when everybody left, even Sherry leaving early. Of course, she came back later. But, um, you know, there, there are times in your career where you have to go, okay, I think I need to move on, you know. Yeah. Uh, and he was already, I mean, phew, I remember him shooting, when he was shooting Batman, he was shooting Batman at night in the ER during the day. I yeah. Was amazing, he lived through it. Yeah, it was like Michael like J. Always, it was like Michael J. Fox on Family Ties and Back to the Future, same thing. Except he was drunk while he was doing it. He just admitted in his book. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, very fat, well, drunk, I must say, because he was great in both. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, with all of them, you have to. And people are so harsh on people when they leave the show. It's like, you know, think about it. You know, we have to think about your longevity and, and your creativity and when it's time to move on and and, uh, and also your personal life, you know. Um, it's not always about, you know, I want more money. You know, sometimes it's about your life and your, and your art. Um, so I think whenever anybody leaves the show, everybody has to take it consideration the rest of the beings that have lives and have to make their decisions accordingly. <laughs> mm -hmm. how, how about the episode when Quentin Tarantino directed? Oh, <laughs> Quentin, he is a trip to work with. Boy, I, only, I just worked with him on that one thing, but I would say it's like working with someone who has, he has the enthusiasm of a 12-year-old, <laughs> but the precision of a surgeon. I yeah. mean, he knew exactly what he wanted, and he, he, he had every shot in his mind. If he, and the other great thing about it is, you, if you're in the scene, he knows that you belong in that scene, and he's going to shoot you. And that was something about we had a we had a, a steady cam operator guy B like that, um, who actually got a letter from the inventor of the steady cam, which they actually mounted and put on the wall of the. 11 that uh, this is what I really meant for this equipment to be used for because you, know, you might remember for them the style was kind of jerky kind of journalistic style and Guy really did that smooth steady cam stuff and the great thing about Guy B who's now a director but at that mm -hmm. time a steady cam operator is that he was a great storyteller with everybody in the room he knew if you're in the room, you count. And that's the way Quentin was, too. Mm -hmm. But he also knew exactly where he wanted to focus on you. So he shot very... I, I also love shooting with people who shoot a lot of other things and then put it together. Um, Mimi is somebody, leader, who, who's, I think, a brilliant director and, and shoots a lot of different angles. Quentin was really surgical and it's like okay that's all i need that piece okay that's all i need this piece so it was fascinating but he was also like oh this is gonna be so cool Wait, what's <laughs> this gonna be happening i mean he was just like that and it was it's infectious you know you have to be excited about it mm -hmm. and i remember seeing him we were at, in the the cafeteria at lunch and he was kind of wandering around with his trail do you want to sit with us he went yeah that'd be great and so he, sat down and said, yeah, yeah he's, he's cut the camera right, and he said, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. we had a nice little lunch with him, and, you know, took the guy, we had a great time with him. 
Oh, that's awesome. Were, were you ever submitted for an Emmy consideration? Uh, I think maybe I submitted myself. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if there was ever a serious uh, submission because, I mean, we won some, some SAG awards, you know, in the very beginning, I think the second, third, fourth years, maybe fifth even. Uh, yeah. But um, the people in the opening montage were the people that were probably, were really considered more for Emmys than our our supporting cast, you know, were <laughs> kind, of, kind of the way. That's kind wrong. Of the way it worked, you know. That's wrong. You should have been nominated and you should have won. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean it. You um, <clears throat> you worked uh, with my friend Nancy Hendrickson on a couple things. I didn't see. Oh, my gosh. Nancy, I, I actually, after I finish talking to you, I, I'm going to call Nancy because we're going to probably go see. Uh, figure out when we can go see our friend Barry Pearl's show. So. Oh, yeah, Barry. I know <laughs> I mean, Barry. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah, we did that series. Uh, Boomers. Couple things that meant, yeah, and before that, she... Weekend Encounter. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at those again. Um, and so, because we were in college together, Nancy and I. Oh, really? And that's how we know each other, yeah. We were in different classes. But, uh, I I talked to her. I talked to her a couple of years ago, and again with the body sense of humor, we hit it off. You know. Yeah, yeah, she's fun. She's fun. Yeah, and I I, I do like Boomers. I've seen the episodes. Uh, my friend Candy Milo was also in there. Oh, Candy's hysterical in it. Yeah. Very very funny together, and and uh, yeah, we had fun doing that. And, um, I knew I, David was in college with us. I, 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 I had known his, gotten to know his wife, Mary Kate, was in it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so we just decided to get together, and then it's on, available on Amazon now. They recut it into, mm -hmm. it was originally webisodes, and they recut it into some half-hour, like, sitcom length things yeah. and put it on the Amazon. So. Yeah, Mars, you... not to be confused with the British drama series, no Mars. More yeah. Baby boomers and uh, yeah, it's fun to do. Yeah, you you got. Fashion cast that come. <laughs> yeah, you you got to be in Stitches and Candy got to be in Bad Medicine. And they both came out in November of 1985. Really? Yes. Wow, I didn't realize that. Oh wow, God, she's wonderful. She's funny. That's funny crazy. Woman. That movie uh, you were trying to think of that Peter Medic directed was The Ruling Class. That's it. My, one of my favorite movies of all time, actually. Yeah, Peter O'Toole. Brilliant, he's... brilliant. Oh, my God. I love that film. And so I was, I was so excited just to work with the director. I don't know that he was as happy in the television medium. He didn't look as happy there, but I don't know. I, I didn't work with him that long. But uh, I just, I'm, the ruling class. If you haven't seen it, is, it is a great movie. It's those 1960s that during that time. 72. Doctor mm -hmm. Strange, Love, The Ruling Class, all those really bizarre kind of movies. I just I don't know. There's, I guess that's my dark side that they really appeal to me. <laughs> oh, we all have our we all have our dark sides. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very dark comedy. Um, Peter O'Toole is just brilliant. To me. Everything he was in, he was brilliant in. Yeah, that's true. It's true. So do you have any upcoming projects you could talk about? Well, uh, the one when you... I know you talk about things that are, uh, are uh, uh, kind of um, fan-based kind of... Uh, there was a movie I did called The Man from Earth, which uh -huh. became kind of a cult hit, which uh, then they did a sequel uh, uh, also... Uh, but um, Man from Earth Holocene was a sequel. But we did this little picture called The Man from Earth, mm -hmm. which grew in popularity. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the, it's kind of like no exit in a way. I mean, it's all these people in a cottage at night, and it's very heady. It's one of the really uh, I mean, it's people who like that sort of no exit philosophical stuff. Uh, but it's I mean, I was getting letters from people. Who, so I got a letter from somebody in Alaska who said, once a month I screen that at my house. 
you know, um, it just was a little, the little picture that could. So, uh, the man from Earth uh, mm. is uh, is still out there, and uh, and I always say when people say, oh, you never would you do it, one of these little pictures, you're never ever going to see any money from it. I say that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> The Man from Earth, and also Angel's Perch that I did, which is a film I loved doing. Um, I was, uh, I had done a couple of shows, actually three shows. We, my husband and I were kind of a, a theater tour. Yeah. Uh, we had done a show together in Maine, and then we came down to North Carolina and did a couple of shows at the theater there. And I got this call asking if I would do this picture called Angel's Perch, and... We actually, from there, were driving to my mother-in-law's memorial in St. Louis, who had died of Alzheimer's, and the picture was uh, starred George Bay Patton uh, about um, kind of the story of his grandmother and his journey with Alzheimer's with her in, mm -hmm. in West Virginia. It's a lovely picture. You can still still stream that, um, Angel Spurge. Um, I know I'm talking about older stuff, but I really did. Uh, those were two two smaller pictures near and dear to my heart that I, I did, that I really enjoyed. Um, and uh, let's see, yeah, I was on, we did my first soap this last year, I think it was, Days of Our Lives, playing the Mother Superior, that oh, was yeah. fun. Uh, and um, I'm trying to think what's going on now. You know, as soon as I say goodbye, I'll go, oh my gosh, I didn't talk about this. <laughs> uh, uh, been interesting doing just as a kind of side thing uh, some dubbing work for international projects. It's kind of fascinating and kind of like a playground because they made a decision that they had better get better dubbing because people in the United States don't like reading subtitles, so over 80% of them. So and they were not watching shows with bad dubs, so they decided they'd better hire uh, actors and real directors to do these things. Mm -hmm. And it's been actually really fun stuff to do. Um, and uh, every possible kind of character, and like I said, it feels like a playground. You go there and you may or may not know what you're going to be doing, uh, but it's... Uh, it's it's been that's that's been a, a hoot to do. Um, oh, I did I did get to work by the way with George briefly on Suburbicon that film. Oh yeah. Um, that was fun to work with him as director. Uh, it's the Matt David Julian Moore um, mm -hmm. uh, film, and that was that was fun to do just to see him again. And I I thought oh I I, I don't want to you know bother him because he may need his space and I you know, got out of the van and he's like, Well hello, how are you today? <laughs> it was it was fun to see him again. Um so yeah, it was uh, you know waiting to hear on some other stuff as always that's our our life and how it works. But um mm -hmm. what yeah. what kind yeah. what kind of what like it, when you read the script, like what 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 do you l l like about it that you have a tendency to gravitate toward? Well, I mean, it depends on what kind of project it is. If it's, I don't, I don't, I don't gravitate as much towards. I, I like playing. I, I I can enjoy playing a mean character, mm -hmm. but <laughs> I I like I I like knowing that. Somebody is a salvageable character in any given project. You know that. Um, that I mean, if you're playing like a villain, the, the, there's always they're human beings, so there are always a lot of different sides to them. But I, I think when I read a script, I like I. I don't gravitate as much to to a story where they're all so mean to each other, and I don't see any possibility of redemption. Right. I think I think I always prefer things that have at least a glimmer of redemption. And they can be very, very, very dark. But um, I think I'm that sort of person who always looks for some sort of redemption. That's interesting. And if it's funny, I want it to be funny. And if it's, you know, uh, 
Yeah, and I think I think I've got a very uh, broad uh, taste uh, for genres, though. Um, so it, it's uh, I'm lucky that way that I can enjoy a lot of different kinds of projects. But yeah, I think I think it's the place where it comes from and somebody's soul that's writing it. Mm-hmm. It sounds very. That sounds really very. Uh, that sounds a little more heavy than I mean it to be, but just, you know. Absolutely, it makes sense, you know. <laughs> well, Ellen, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. I can't tell you what an honor this has been. Well, thank you, and oh my goodness, I'm so, I'm so flattered that you knew probably more about my work than I did, and I see this romance theater here. I was looking at yeah, I, I, I have no idea what this is. 1982, I wasn't, I wasn't even here. I was in Chicago. So I'm going to have to look into that and see what, what the heck that's supposed to be. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, I would have had to have been shooting it either in Chicago or New York, because that's where I was in 1982. Yeah. Besides that, and a sheepherder's wagon in Wisconsin, where my husband and I took a weekend uh, honeymoon after got married. But <laughs> I don't think I shot it there. I would have remembered that. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, thank you. This has been a pleasure. Uh, it has been, and you have yourself a great day, and please be safe out there. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. You too. Th- thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Ellen Crawford, ain't she a sweetheart? What a great lady, huh? And I'm so glad we got to have this talk today, and... She is just so amazing and, again, so funny. She's great at comedy. Go check out things that she has done because she is a national treasure. And so is her husband, Mike uh, Genovese. Sorry, I didn't mean to say Genovese at the beginning. It's Genovese. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.